Every January in Nepal, families reunite to celebrate the new year. But Olga Marie of Sausalito knows for some Nepali girls, it's anything but a happy time. The 83-year-old widow founded the Nepalese Youth Opportunity Foundation two decades ago to help the country's neediest children. At a particular festival in mid-January called Maghe Sakranti, uh, families more or less sell their daughters to labor contractors. The girls start usually pretty young, six, seven, eight, nine. The families who sell these girls are usually desperately, desperately poor. And uh, they do it because sometimes she's the only one in the family who has a job and they need it to feed their other children. You can understand why parents are forced to do this. That you have a certain amount of sympathy for parents in this circumstance. She's often beaten, sometimes sexually abused. This is how they live their entire childhoods, in fact. And they live in conditions similar to slavery. In fact, the United Nations classifies this practice as slavery. These live-in girl servants are known as Kemlaris. For some Kemlaris, their lives will never be the same. Her name is Anita Chaudhary, and she was sent to work as Kemlari by her parents when she was very young. And when he reached the age of 12 or 13, her employer, who was a teacher, uh, he took the opportunity to rape her. Anita said she became pregnant by her employer three times. She was forced to have two abortions and kept her third pregnancy a secret. Then the one she got third time pregnant and she gave birth to a child, son, who is now two years old. Her life is miserable. Her, she is looked down by the locals, the neighbors, and even her own parents uh, uh, are not very happy with her. So she is uh, basically in a crossroad of her life. You know, where am I, where am I going to go, how am I going to uh, raise this child? With the help of Olga's charity, Anita is suing her employer to establish paternity. If proven, she's entitled to some of his land, which would keep her out of poverty and provide for her child. Seeing the damage the Kamlari practice has done to some of these girls, Olga came up with a plan to stop the practice altogether. We came up with the system years ago. We give the family a baby piglet or a goat, whichever is their preference, if they will uh, bring the girl home and let her stay at home. Hello, okay. Oh, there's a competition which they want. <laughs> we put the girl in school at our own expense. Um, this process sometimes takes quite a while. It's a matter of convincing the parents that they are not going to suffer economically, that their daughter is suffering terribly, uh, and that the girl, that their daughter needs to be educated. In almost every case, the girl is very, very happy to come home again and live with her family. But the family sometimes feels that, that they will suffer economically and that they need the income of the girl. La, la, la. Okay. La, la, la. <laughs> Our aim is to make them economically independent. And those who are bigger girls, they may go uh, through six months non-formal education program. And then we place them in vocational training program. Uh, and the vocational training program we have tried so far could be henna farming, could be sewing program and could be vegetable, you know, like a collective vegetable program, like a co-ops. Uh, at least a dozen of these girls have started their own sewing businesses. They, they have broken off from there. Olga has concentrated her efforts for the past eight years in the Dong district of southwestern Nepal, where she's rescued 4,300 girls. In January, she marched with hundreds of them, calling for an end to girl slavery. Despite their success in Dong, there are still four other districts where the Kamlari trade is intact. In a small Taru village in the Kailali district, you can still see open-air deals between poor parents and Kamlari buyers. Brokers on motorcycles appear in Taru villages during the Magi Sankranti festival. Those motorcycle guys are the middlemen, most of them. 
those are practically they are pimps. They know which Taru family has girl because they are local. They know which Taru family is very poor and they know who they can tempt those poor family with 2,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees, you know, $30, $50. The Nepalese Youth Opportunity Foundation has not yet expanded its work into Kailali. This man, a clothing store owner, drove from a larger city three hours away to renegotiate the contract of his 10-year-old Kamlari with her father. As Kauzi Chowdhury sat between her parents, they argued over selling her. The father refused to sell. The mother insisted they needed the $80 for rice. In the end, they didn't sell, but the father later admitted that's because he sold to somebody else who came by in the morning with a higher price and half the money up front. Although Ola's charity has not yet reached Kailali, it is moving into the Banke district, where volunteers board buses looking for Kamlaris on their way to servant jobs. At the Kahalpur bus stop, volunteers questioned this woman who they believed was taking a young girl to be her servant. We asked for the girl's name and her and what village she was from, and uh, this woman did all the talking. When we asked the girl a question, the woman would tell the girl what to say, and she looked very scared. Things got a little tense when the woman wouldn't answer the volunteers' questions, but eventually she said the girl's name was Gita and named the village where she was taking her. The woman refused to let the girl speak and kept her away from volunteers. We went to the village that she told us the girl was from, and uh, there were no Taru girls in that village at all. So she had, she had uh, not told us the truth, and we were not, we were not that surprised. <laughs> but even that is progress. I mean, I, I think she was hesitant to say that she was employing this girl, and that was not the case when we first went into this area. We'll find her.